Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Gandek and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Lynn Community Health Center. We're so excited to have you all with us tonight as we share a conversation between Dr. Kiyami Mahanya and actor and writer Jason Manzukis. I'm extra excited after the evening's panel discussion following the uh, video featuring three of our exceptional program staff, uh, Dr. Annalie Wells, or our, our Orange Team Medical Director, Dr. Liz Quinn, family physician, uh, and Leticia Goulot, our lead peer recovery coach. If we're unable to get to your question or to another one that you are interested in, uh, you can email our director of development, Claire Hayes, at chayes at lchcnet.org, and we'll put that email address in the chat as well. And we'll be happy to answer your questions via email. Uh, we do want to make sure we get those answered for you. With that, uh, Kiyami, I'll turn it over to you, our CEO, uh, to introduce tonight's session. Well, thank you, Kristen, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our event this evening. We are very, very proud to share more about our substance use disorder treatment programs, a bit of their history, and to give you a quick glimpse in one of the aspects of our world. This is the fourth and the last in our video series. As Kristen mentioned, the first three on our website and our YouTube channel, so please go there to enjoy them. And before we get to so far, I'd like to say thank you to the sponsors of this video series, especially Cambridge Savings Bank, Stainless Communication, and the Demarcus families and all the old neighborhood, old neighborhood foods. Thank you for making it possible to create these videos and host these events as we share these programs with our community. And ultimately, we use it to increase access to healthcare in Lynn. And for the rest of the audience, you can find a full list of our sponsors on our website. So as usual, in addition to our panelists, I'm joined by my co-host tonight, Jason. Jason. How are things out in that den of inequity that you call California? Oh, pretty good. You know, it is a, a, a beautiful sunny day as it is every day in Los Angeles, which is, as somebody from the East Coast, maddening um, to be in, to have no weather change feels like time is slipping by impossibly fast. Um, but it's a gorgeous day. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm very excited for this uh fourth in our series of videos. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it out here in Los Angeles. A lot of people are talking about it. There's, I mean, I'm hearing rumors that you're being considered for a role in the Fast and Furious movies. Kiami, <laughs> are you are you ready to speak to these rumors? Are you going to be in the Fast and Furious? Yes, but it's Fast and Furious <laughs> 17, which is projected oh, for 2050. So okay, <laughs> smart, smart play. You know, you're doing the rest of your work here in Lynn and then you'll have your movie yeah. career. Yes. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Jason. And thanks for um, joining us tonight. Uh, it's always great. And I know that uh, your father are clearly, for those of you who are aficionados of our series, you know that uh, Jason is the son of our beloved founder, um, Bill Manzukis, And I know he's enjoying, uh, enjoying seeing you in the audience today. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure he'll, t he'll tell me later all, all about it. Uh, and, and I'm going to hear every word. So it's going to be great. Very good. So Kristen, I think we're ready for the video to launch. Hey, everyone. My name is Jason Manzukis, and I am thrilled to be back with Dr. Kiyami Mahania, practicing physician and CEO of the Lynn Community Health Center in Lynn, Massachusetts. In 2022, we are celebrating our 50th plus one anniversary, and this is part of a series of videos to celebrate the significance and impact of this organization. If you're wondering why that actor from The Good Place or Brooklyn Nine-Nine is appearing in a video series about the Lynn Community Health Center, haha, there's an answer. My father, Bill Manzukis, was one of the founders of the Lynn Community Health Center in 1971 and served as its first executive director. So I'm thrilled to be here having these conversations with Kiami. Kiami, how are you? I'm doing well, Jason. We're sort of in the same age category. We do vastly different things. And yet you had your father as this sort of father figure and I have him now as his mentor and coach. Yeah, no, no, it's absolutely. We are we are both uh, in many ways uh, influenced by the same man, by the same by the same father figure, which is, you know, makes us I guess brothers in a way, competing <laughs> for our father's love. There you go. 
So, Kiami, what I'd love to talk to you about uh, right now and the kind of focus of this video is the opioid addiction crisis. What kind of substance use disorder services do you offer at the Lynn Community Health Center? And you introduced me as a practicing physician. So I take care of patients who are all over that sort of spectrum of recovery from actively using to sober times 20 years. It used to be mainly a first world problem, meaning we saw it a lot in the U.S. and in Europe. But now really it's gone uh, to middle income countries, places like Mexico, Brazil, or uh, Russia, are really suffering from this opioid uh, addiction. And then also in poorer countries, so places like Kenya, Tanzania, Afghanistan are really seeing this explosion. And the U.S. has not been immune to that. Sure. And Lynn in particular has had uh, this huge explosion. I'm curious, how did the Lynn Community Health Center start offering services for people having substance use disorder? Now, the health center uh, that was started as a mental health center, the idea of treating trauma and treating pain has always been at the center of what we do. And substance use disorder was really seen as another source of trauma. So the, the Lynn Community Health Center has been treating substance use disorder uh, since its inception, long before it actually had this sort of name and this recognition. Because we have this wide spectrum of mental health uh, therapy, we have this wide spectrum of substance use disorder services. It melds uh, pharmacology with clinical and mental health therapies. Um, and we, so we've always offered that care. What's really happened over the decades is that it's grown in size, and it's also grown in terms of how society looks at it. Since the 20s and 30s, uh, substance use disorder has been seen as a, as a sort of moral failure, uh, and then it morphed into a legal and a criminal uh, issue. And it's really taken us almost 100 years to accept the science of the fact that addiction is actually a disease. So how are you reaching those people who are struggling with addiction and who need these services that the Lynn Community Health Center provides? So although it's clear that it is an issue that the whole community benefits from, there are clearly pockets of the community that need these services more than others. So 50 years ago, it was mostly a male problem, whereas now it's pretty equal women to men. So we also need programs that are made to be accessible uh, to women and to people of color, uh, and particularly to people who, who prefer to be served in a language other than English. It is a constant struggle, which is how do you reach people who by very dish definition feel that society has either shunned them or discriminated against them in some ways? How do you reassure them that we will not uh, contribute more to their pain, but that we will actually help them deal with their pain? I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the peer recovery coaches on your staff. How do those positions work with the whole care team? These are generally people with lived experience, meaning that at some point in their lives, they themselves uh, were, using, were using drugs and now they're uh, sober. Um, and so they bring a kind of um, knowledge and emotional intelligence and ability to relate that nobody else in the team can really uh, duplicate. And they become essentially the main member, the most important member of the team that the patient is turning to. We are able to provide better services and longer services when peer recovery coaches are involved. I'd love for you to break down for me, what is the Moms Do Care program? It's a program that was started as part of a grant from a patient's perspective is that you show up uh, pregnant you get taken care of by this team during the pregnancy. It's the same team that goes with you to the hospital to deliver your baby. It's the same team that takes care of your baby and you while you're in the hospital. And it's the same team that then takes care of you when you come out of the hospital. Uh, so that means that for an illness that is really defined by the stigma and by the difficulty that patients experience to reveal this kind of stigma, to have just this one team, you know, so you, you tell your story once, and then that's it. You're set for five, 10 years. And it's the same team that's caring for you that gets to know you on a deeper social justice level. What we're really trying to figure out is, okay, if someone is using today, what does it take so that in five years, when the kid shows up to kindergarten, that that kid has, is well-balanced, uh, has a great mom, 
has great family support, and is ready for kindergarten? Like, what does it take? What kind of services do you need to put in place before the child is born in order for that to happen? So the services we offer at Lincoln Health Center as a whole also include the services we provide on the Orange Team. Um, we offer primary care and substance use disorder treatment. We offer low barrier access to treatment with a no wrong door policy. The patient might come and present on Orange Team. We will get them on medication, stabilize them a little bit, and then we'll connect them with a primary care doctor on an integrated primary care team. So Link Health Center um, has a no wrong door policy where a patient um, presenting for treatment can access care no matter where they come. Whether that be urgent care, their primary care doctor, um, walking into the orange team, or they call and, and speak to a triage nurse, wherever they present, asking for help in the moment, they're able to be connected with services. We want to meet patients where they're at, um, providing compassionate care. One of the reasons that I am so uh, committed to continuing to work at LCHC is that we have such a wonderful obstetric service. It's multidisciplinary. We have family physicians, OBGYNs, and nurse midwives. We truly work collaboratively and work to build consensus about how we care for patients. That has meant that as a family doctor, all in one place, in one exam room, I can see a pregnant woman, do her prenatal care, assess her addiction, discuss treatment with her, and then Postnatally, I can provide the pediatric care for her child and do that all at the same time and in the same place, and then be connected to on our team uh, mental health professionals, case management professionals who are also focused on that population. So I work on the Sunflower Team on the Moms Do Care Grant, and the Sunflower Team Moms Do Care Grant allows us to especially focus on moms, so either pregnant, postpartum, or moms who have a child under three years old, and also have a substance use disorder. So I think our program is really special because of the peer support aspect. I think, you know, some other parts of my job are being able to bring the patient voice into our team meetings or our case discussions and really sort of make sure that we're being as trauma informed as we can as a team. There's a recovery orientation to the whole system. I became a recovery coach because of the care that I got here at Link Community Health Center. So I have a daughter, she's six, and I have twin boys who are three years old. And my daughter, I really struggled through that pregnancy. I also have a substance use disorder. I'm in, I'm in recovery and really just met with compassion and kindness every time I walked into the door. I saw one of the doctors that I had seen during my pregnancy with my daughter, and she told me about this really cool thing they were doing across the street called Moms Do Care, and they were looking for a peer mom with experience with a substance use disorder and experience being a mom. You know, we're in the community. Our faces are out there. People know, oh, yeah, I can, I can call Tisha, and she can get me in with a doctor, or she can get me in with a nurse. And so constantly linking people to services is something that I think uh, people should know that recovery coaches are doing. Where I'm visiting people in hospital rooms, in labor, and you know, and things like that, and uh, we're visiting people at the shelter, at our local syringe exchange. We're 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 boots on the ground in the community, um, and I think that's so important to this work. Most of our moms have housing insecurity, so they're either in a shelter situation or they're staying with friends or family, and it's just not a stable place. A lot of times that will lead to a, a more in-depth investigation from the Department of Children and Families. You know, the, the big COVID silver lining that we've experienced is the ability to do phone visits. That has been a tremendously wonderful change in my practice over the last two years that when I think it's clinically safe and important to do so, I'm able to talk to a patient via the phone, prescribe them buprenorphine um, to get started on. And it has just really lowered the threshold for care. We on Orange Team remained open the entire time. So we were able to offer injectable medications and we were open for sort of high risk patients when they needed. However, most of our visits did get shifted to telemedicine and we are still able to offer services same day um, for patients who are interested in care. So when you add on a pandemic, I think it just enhances that isolation. And so really just feeling like you are alone and that oftentimes can make somebody have a return to use. Part of being a recovery coach is being sort of that model, that that 
sort of guiding light for somebody in their recovery journey. And I know when I was actively using substances, I didn't know that recovery was possible. I didn't know that people stopped using substances and and went on to lead a fulfilling life. Something that I would love the audience to know about moms who do struggle with a substance use disorder or do struggle to enter and stay in recovery is that both instincts are really, really strong, right? So I struggle all the time with having this huge identity of being a mom and having this huge huge identity of being a person in recovery because they have competing interests sometimes. Something I would love for uh, people to know about moms in recovery is just the incredible strength it takes to be a mom and be in recovery and balance these two really huge identities. There is this stigma about substance use disorder, but I think that stigma is only enhanced when you're talking about people who are pregnant and have a substance use disorder and are actively using. So did you just choose drugs over your child when you were using, (laughs) when you were using while you were pregnant? But I think that something the medical community has come to understand is that substance use disorder is a disease and it needs treatment, right? And it's not something that somebody controls. Moms Do Care funding is very generous for the healthcare team, like supporting our staffing, but it's not designed to provide material supports for individual patient families. So if we had unlimited funding. Well, if I had an unlimited source of money, I would add housing resources. Um, Having housing, that is definitely something that our moms struggle with. And for food. Full staffing, wraparound services for all patients, intensive case management, peer recovery support. I would just enhance in-person programming. Wish list items might include a like drop-in center where people can engage in services, maybe have some coffee, hang out, and, and have a safe place to go. Increase funding for more material things. A lot of our moms struggle with food insecurity. Patients can respectfully shop for donations and, and, and things that they need. Patients often come in without a lot of things. Just struggling with getting material things like hygiene products or feminine hygiene products, things like that would be um, really important. And so we very regularly are having to creatively look around the community for donations for baby supplies, for diapers particularly, for maternity clothes and other supplies for moms. Moms Do Care really upped the ante on that because it insisted you need to have this person with lived experience who has this voice at that table. And then by having that person and a nurse case manager and a community health work worker, you're expanding the bounds of what the care looks like. And now that I've seen what that adequate care looks like, I want that for all of my patients. That's really consistent with the history of community health centers. You know, um, there's like the apocryphal story about community health center founders insisting on having rocking chairs on the front porch of the health center so that moms could rock their babies and that that was part of the care. People saying, you know, you can't give prescriptions for food. Um, and the founders of the community health center movement saying, the last time I checked the, this, you know, treatment for uh, malnutrition is, is food. Um, so let me prescribe that. And I think, you know, this is really an extension of that. We love what we do and we'd love to take care of more patients. We have the capacity to do so. We just need to sort of know the people that we're here for them. You have all of these elements that are assembled in different ways can be used to such effect, you know, for different need. I think that that comes from the fact that we're starting from a point of being a community health center. And so it's just great to be able to be part of an institution where, yes, we have to be financially viable, meaning that we want to make sure that everybody gets paid. But the fact that we're not focused on making money, but we're focused on fulfilling a community need means that programs like this have a chance to emerge. How can we take one plus one plus one and have it equal seven instead of three, which is what happened uh, in this case? So what do you need in order to keep being able to provide these services? It relies on the greater society not losing interest in providing the institutional supports for our most vulnerable patients. It relies on government at the state, federal, local level to keep being interested, to keep thinking of these patients as us and not them. If you're watching this video at home and would like to learn more about the Lynn Community Health Center and how to support it, what it does, please visit their website, which you can see on screen here now, but is also lchcnet.org slash donate. You can learn more and you can help support this absolutely vital organization in the community. Kiami, 
Thank you so much for making the time to talk to me today about the substance use disorder programs at the Lynn Community Health Center. Jason, as usual, you know, thank you for uh, the generous uh, time that you've given this. I know it's near and dear to you through the collect connection through your father, but I know that you've been incredibly busy uh, and it's always such a pleasure and such a joy to be able to share these moments with you. You know, I'm out in the street, I'm walking around. Sometimes people recognize me from Brooklyn Nine-Nine or sometimes from, uh, you know, The Good Place. But you know, more often than not, now they're just, they're pointing at me and they're screaming, Lynn Community Health Center! Yeah, Lynn Community Health Center! All right, uh, we hope you all enjoyed that short peek into some of our programs. We'll open it up now for questions through that Q&A function at the bottom uh, center of your screen that we mentioned earlier. Uh, I see one question coming in already. Uh, thank you, Rachel. We will definitely get to that today. Um, others can, you can upvote that uh, based on the little thumbs up icon underneath the question uh, and continue to add other questions as they come to your mind. Uh, to get started, um, as we introduced previously, Dr. Mahani is joined by uh, Dr. Annalie Wells, the Orange Team Medical Director, uh, Dr. Liz Quinn, a family physician, and Letitia Gulo, who's our fabulous lead peer recovery coach. Um, so Kiami, let's start with you as folks are continuing to answer some questions. In the video, um, you and Jason really pretty briefly note that um, you are a practicing physician and specifically practice on Orange Team. Can you share if there was something in particular that drew you to work uh, with these programs at Link Community Health Center? Can we address, the question is about addressing uh, experience with patient uh, digital literacy and access to the internet and devices longer term. Uh, how does this work in the community when people have housing instability? And I think all of you mentioned housing instability in particular. Um, so in the order on my screen, um, uh, Tisha, you're listed first, and then we've got Dr. Wells and uh, Dr. Quinn. Um, could we maybe start with you and then uh, the others can add as something comes to mind? Yeah. Uh, fair warning, I am flying solo as the solo parent to three young children at home, so don't mind the background noise if there is any. Um, but I think this is a huge problem that we've noticed, especially lately in terms of not so much digital literacy, but uh, access to like stable internet phone access to access these um you know, telemedicine visits or virtual groups or things like that. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of our patients who will get sort of um, a government issued phone um, and then those minutes run out and then they're sort of left with, you know, that same um, insecurity that they had before. So that's something I'd like to add. It's very hard to deliver telehealth when a person doesn't have a phone. Um, so that's why we did do actually a lot of in-person visits for our patients who don't have that access. Um, for the like groups and the televideo, we would offer our, we have a computer that we can give to patients to use. Um, so it'd be really great if we had more iPads and more devices that we can sort of lend or have patients use so they can engage in IOPs and other groups that are virtual. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking of a couple of examples of uh, patients I have whose children needed medical specialty appointments and what was available to them was virtual um, in the last couple of years. Uh, and we literally, in some cases, had them come to the health center to have them work with Tisha or another member of our team to get the virtual visit platform working for them. So they were sitting at a health center doing a virtual visit with a physician at a specialty center because they didn't have the capacity either technically or due to devices to make that happen. Um, and I, I think that that's just, that's actually incredibly common. I've had many, many people for whom it is much easier for them to get to Peabody than it is to figure out the tech to interface with a Boston Children's Hospital doctor virtually. Um, so the digital divide is real. Um, I think the housing insecurity makes it worse. And I think that the thing I have most experienced is people need flexibility. So I have patients for whom it's most important for them to come in and be seen in person. And I have other patients or the same patient, but at a different time or in a different situation for whom a phone call with me um, is the most important thing. Um, and keeping it, and I know that this is like a, a really, uh, touchy reimbursement subject kind of more globally, but keeping it so that telephone visits and not just virtual video visits are accessible to patients and are reimbursed is I think incredibly important for the functioning of this kind of like uh, across the spectrum communication. 
Since everything is really integrated and there's certainly no shortage of, of ways to approach it, but I, I know all of your teams have um, been very creative throughout COVID and, and before that, right? I think a lot of that creativity, just you know your programs well, you know your, your patients and your audiences really well. Um, another question that's coming up in the chat uh, via the Moms Do Care program, so maybe um, uh, Tisha, we can start with you again, and then uh, Liz, you can add on. Via the Moms Do Care program, is there an opportunity for partners or spouses to participate in care in conjunction with the patient? This is something we've uh, thought long and hard about, I think, uh, as we've had more and more moms uh, with partners who are also in recovery, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, and also, we want to provide care to the whole family because we know how important um, that is for uh, child stabilities. Um, so uh, luckily, we are uh, we have family physicians, so we can see, definitely see the whole family. So we've done that with a number of our patients, which I think is really important. We've also identified that sometimes those relationships are not always smooth or easy relationships. And so um, we've also built in the capacity in our program for um, fathers or partners to access therapy that is not integrated with the rest of us so that confidentiality can be maintained. Um, so we've worked out a way for a ther an LCHC therapist, but an LCHC therapist who doesn't come to the regular Moms Do Care weekly team meetings, um, has some time in his schedule to be able to prioritize uh, the fathers in our program um, or the fathers who are, who are partnered with, with women in our program. Um, and then they're able to do that confidentially and we can connect them to the support, um, you know, but then also kind of maintain privacy um, for those relationships. A variety of, of ways to support that. Uh, Dr. Wells, something to add? Yes, and right now we're physically located right next to the Mom to Care program. So um, partners and family members, friends are welcome to come to the Orange Team while we're right next door. Orange and sunflower, it's like the, the shiny colors and it's, it's everyone's right there. Um, mm -hmm. Another question that, that's coming up um, for Orange Team, so Dr. Wells, we'll start with you. Um, how large is your staff? Uh, maybe speak to the variety of their roles a little bit. And then how many patients, give or take, um, are on the Orange Team's panel? I'm all but a mighty team. Um, I'll speak to sort of ideal sort of staffing. Um, and uh, right now we have one full-time nurse practitioner. Um, um, Dr. Mahania spends um, one session a week with us. Um, I am 24 hours of clinical um, care. And we have, um, ideally we had four nurse case managers. We're down to two right now. Um, we have two recovery coaches, um, a community health worker, um, who is fabulous and will um, you know, assess, you know, patients needs do PT1s, um, referrals for food and housing. Um, you know, she's really a, a important um, person on the team. We have um, one therapist. Uh, we, I think we're staffed for a couple more. We have a psychopharm provider who works very closely with us. And, you know, we get people in urgently if they, if they need psychopharm. Um, and Cammy, am I missing anybody? No, I sure think I that's about it. it. You're you're correct. Small but mighty. And we have about 500 patients in care on um, with with opioid disorder, um, out of 1,500 with that diagnosis, um, and about 500 um, people on buprenorphine and various products. Um, a couple others on. And, um, medications as well. Small but mighty indeed, uh, with uh, quite a variety of staff. Um, I have to say, working on the, the project, this was uh, in relation to more of the Sunflower team, but it's a similar approach, right, that multidisciplinary and cross-functional approach to get to hear um, more about how all of that, all, all of those team members work together in and out every day, uh, right, to provide specific care for each unique and individual patient in each unique and individual situation. And all three of you have already mentioned something about that, whether it's with um, telehealth or whether it's with housing um, or whether it's with partners, even just over the course of the last few minutes uh, in conversation. Um, so let's go, um, let's go to the Moms Do Care grant. Um, Tisha, there's a, a longer part of your interview where you explain what a uh, filing is. Um, and we, we didn't have time to put all of it into this particular video, but could you explain um, that process a little bit to this audience and to those watching? I think it's, it's pretty critical in understanding and really fully grasping the breadth of the Moms Do Care grant. In general, a filing uh, is somebody who, it comes from somebody who's a mandated reporter um, or somebody from the community who files with the Department of Children and 
and families if they are worried or suspect neglect or abuse of a child. Uh, we experience this a lot with our moms because a lot of our moms do have an opioid use disorder and they are on medications for that disorder. And uh, that right now in Massachusetts uh, has a, requires a 51A to be filed at birth, at delivery. Um, and so I do a lot of work with our moms, sort of preparing them for that. Um, and that and that could be for a variety of different uh you know, places of recovery. So some of our moms are new in recovery. Some have entered into recovery, you know, during the later part of their pregnancy. Some have been stable in their recovery for uh, quite some time. And so, but everyone sort of does this sort of one-on-one -on -one with me where we do what is called a plan of safe care, uh, which basically just re uh, lays out all of um, your supports, their contact information, and you want to sign those releases of information before you deliver um, so that, uh, you know, the Department of Children and Families can contact your providers and check in on how you're doing. Um, and that filing uh, may lead to a removal of custody from uh, the parent, or it may not. Um, and so I do a lot of support if there is a removal and then a lot of support because most of our moms uh, have their uh, case opened with the Department of Children and Families, which means uh, the department will be in their lives for uh, quite some time following delivery. Um, I think, is that what you want me to speak to, basically? Yeah, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, uh, Liz, it, it makes me think of another part of, of your interview as well around um, just speaking to your ability as a, a family physician with the Moms to Care grant to then be able to provide that dyadic care um, following um, a birth, regardless of, of what the outcome of, of what that filing might be. Could you speak to that a little bit uh, in particular? Uh, I think you, you speak to it very eloquently. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a huge part of why I do this work and why I do this work where I do it, um, because I'm able to really be a family physician um, and addiction is a big part of what my whole job role is, but I'm able to do it as a family physician. So I'm um, treating mom as a mom and really seeing her in that role and being able to see her in that role, in addition to her role as a person in recovery. Um, and then I'm also treating her children and um, and then in some cases, some wonderful cases, I have some of my moms who now have reached out to their moms and uh, I'm now the PCP for their moms as well. So I have some three generational moms do care families that um, it's incredibly satisfying to do that work. Um, in particular around uh, DCF engagement, um, being able to live through that experience with a woman um, where she has a sense of trust with you as her provider and trust with you as you're in the process of communicating with the Department of Children and Families about her recovery um, journey is both a tremendous responsibility that we take incredibly seriously on our team um, and also a real honor and a privilege um, to go through that time of vulnerability with someone. Um, and I think it's one of many areas where adding a peer recovery mom, Leticia, to our care team um, transformed the way we were able to do care. So previously, um, when we were doing this work, but without a peer recovery coach, if a child was removed at the time of delivery, it was often very or soon after, it was really incredibly difficult to remain engaged with uh, the, the mother. Um, even though we know that the period after the removal of a child, data shows us is an incredibly high risk time for overdose and death for women. Um, so losing uh, connection with a patient who's been engaged in recovery at that critical juncture uh, was devastating for us, both for the patients and for the care team. Um, being engaged with a peer recovery mom who is engaged with us and able to kind of uh, work through that experience with patients made it possible for us to remain engaged with women even as their children were being removed um, and as they lived through that incredibly traumatizing experience. And I truly believe it saved lives. I, tr I, I can think of individuals who I know would not have remained connected with us likely would have backtracked in their recovery, relapsed and died. Um, and so I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to work with a peer recovery coach because I think it continues to, to help to extend our life-saving capacity. That's um, really incredible, Liz. Um, Tisha, I wonder as the, the peer recovery coach, um, if there's anything that you would add to that 
um, or any, any, um, yeah, anything to add. Yeah, I think something that's really powerful about the peer recovery coach perspective and being on sort of an interdisciplinary team and being part of things like case reviews and patient reviews where we sort of discuss where a patient's at as a team uh, is really being able to bring that patient perspective into the room. Um, and I can think of a specific example that Liz will remember uh, probably quite vividly. Uh, we had a mom who was uh, 42 weeks pregnant, over 42 weeks pregnant, which I mean, to me, I didn't know what that meant, but but many of the doctors were very uh, scared and nervous for this patient um, because it could lead to a lot of very, very dangerous things for mom and baby. Um, and we were sort of talking about sort of what that meant about mom's perspective and mom's, uh, you know, thinking and rationale uh, during this time. And I really felt like I was able to sort of put myself in mom's shoes uh, because I felt like I had had a similar experience to her. She had some other um things going on in her life that potentially could have led to a file and actually did did that could have led to a removal and it actually did lead to a removal um and so you know I remember being in the hospital and uh, the department of children and families calling me and telling me that they had taken custody of my daughter and she was in the nursery at the time and I remember just saying to the nurse like just bring her back in the room and I'll put her back inside of me. Uh, this like magical thinking of like, I just need to do whatever I need to do to protect my child. Um, and so I could really relate to the patient and being able to bring that to the team, I think really able, gave us the ability to sort of shift our view and shift our thinking uh, about this patient in particular. I'm sure there are many such, um, many such stories, many such um family members and, and community members that um, you've been able to provide that for. I appreciate you sharing. Um, another question that's come up in, in the question and answer, uh, maybe Annalie will start with you on this one. Um, when ref referencing um, substance use disorder services, we often hear or assume that um, MAT therapy, MAT, uh, is treatment related just to opioids. Uh, is this available for alcohol or other substances as well? So I like to clarify terminology, um, MAT, medication for addiction treatment, because that encompasses all medications for other um, substance use disorders, including alcohol, very common. Um, we have a lot of stimulant use disorder um, and we have um, you know, FDA approved treatments for that. Um, although there's no medications approved, we have um, other uh, modalities to offer. Um, so yeah. MAT um, would be medication for um, all addiction, and then MOUD specifically medication for opioid use disorder. I know also um, one of the, the questions that we had talked about was just explaining a little bit more around the no wrong door approach. Um, they're not directly related, but the, it, you know, all sort of understanding different terms um, for, for some audience members who might not be quite as familiar with um, this particular type of care. Could you share a little bit, uh, Dr. Wells, about the no, no wrong door trauma-informed care, starting with harm reduction? These are all um, sort of keywords that we use uh, to talk about these programs. And I uh, might toss the ball to the moms do care folks because um, they're actually the ones who had um, grant funding to do some education um, for the health center. Um, but so our no wrong door um, basically means that we have low barrier access. So ideally, if anyone, anyone calls or presents, even if the person that they're speaking to can't offer immediate services in that moment, they're able to refer them to someone who can help them. Um, so that we're capturing people in the moment that they present for care, uh, because you don't want to lose that opportunity. Um, so even if they're calling someone in reception, that person can say, yes, I can help you and get them connected. Um, so whether they're urgent care on a primary care team, um, or they're walking into Orange, um, where we can offer them a same day appointment. So um, try and really do our best to capture folks when they're ready for treatment. Um, harm reduction services. Um, so um, this is sort of meeting people where they're at. Um, in, uh, Dr. Mahani, I mentioned this before, so the full spectrum of folks in active use to those who've been in long-term recovery um, and sort of having a non-judgmental approach um, to reducing um, risk of harms associated with substance use. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, I work with a, a great team, um, colleagues um, across the street, of course, next door. Um, I'm actually going to trust the trauma-informed care ball to Liz and um, Tisha. We know from our experience working with this patient, patient population and um, what the data shows us when this patient population is studied, particularly um, all people with addiction, but particularly women with addiction and even more particularly to that pregnant women with addiction, um, that the rates of trauma are greater than 90%. And often those traumas are um, sexual traumas. Um, and so uh, when we look and I'm, pleased that kind of the medical community generally is now looking more carefully at 
Uh, what is the neurobiology of trauma? What does that lead people? To have? What kind of behaviors um, does that lead people to have? Um, and it often means that people will be um, have incredible difficulty trusting the medical system. And so a large part of um, trauma-informed care uh, on our team is um, allowing people to remain in as much control of their care as they possibly can. Um, so doing as much shared care and as much autonomy enhancing care as I can um, and calling out the ways for patients, making 100% clear to patients that they are the ones in control. Um, so before I do uh, a genital exam ever as a physician on any patient, I say, I want you to know that you are the boss. And so at any point, if you need me to stop or to change what I'm doing, you say stop and I stop. And I take the time to say that sentence because that's part of my universal precaution of trauma-informed care, because I know that the rates of trauma in my community are so high that chances are the person in front of me has had a significant trauma experience where their control and their autonomy was taken away. Um, so uh, for me, the process of learning about trauma-informed care and learning how to implement it has been, how can I make my medical practice one that returns autonomy and control as much as possible to my patients. Um, and so that's something that we're continuously talking on our team about. And it's, you can imagine that it's particularly contentious in a setting where uh, women have at stake the chance to parent their child. Um, and so they will often feel that they are being forced into treatment with me um, because they need to show that they're engaging in treatment. And so then part of my extra challenge of my job is to say, sure, you may feel like you're being forced into treatment with me, but what are ways that in our treatment plan we can come up with that allows you to be, uh, have as much autonomy as, as you can? Um, so that's something that we work on a lot and we spend a lot of time in our team meetings, like really thinking through um, how we can kind of best engage with, with people who, who bring a lot to the table. Um, and, um, and avoid re-traumatizing because we know that the medical system historically has been a, a place uh, where people, particularly people who use drugs, um, have experienced a lot of humiliation, closed doors, uh, stigma, uh, and, uh, and controlling behavior from the medical community. Um, so we've really worked hard to try to uh, flip the table on that. Um, and put the control back in the hands of our patients. I just would like to add that I think we do a lot of this training like across the health center, across some of our community partners um, about what is trauma-informed care, how to implement it and things like that, because I think we're really invested in making sure that our patients don't just have this experience at the community health center on our team, uh, but also in the community. So I think that's also really important. Thank you um, all very much for your thoughtful answers. Um, we are just about out of time uh, tonight. So uh, Kiami, I'll turn it back over to you uh, to close this out this evening. Yes, well, for the audience, you can see that uh, the, the wonderful team that you get to hear for, you can hear from, you can tell that this is not a job, but this is a calling, this is a passion uh, that they have. And uh, uh, I really, I really greatly enjoy my clinical time on the team. and. Uh, like all three of them, I really, I, I think we've mentioned also, we, could, we might not have mentioned it explicitly, but there is this great joy that we feel uh, in working with the patients. And in many ways, I say that I get more out of the interaction than the patients do. Um, and I think all of us, you can tell, we've all really grown and really uh, cherish uh, the trust that patients put in us. So thank you, Anna Lee. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Liz, for for taking the time this evening to educate our audience. And I know that there's always so much, many more questions. Obviously they're all available. Uh, you can always reach out through Claire to us if there's something in particular that you wanted to find out. And thank you to our three presenting sponsors. So Cambridge Savings Bank, the Marcus family and Old Neighborhood Foods as well as Stainless Communication and all the donors and the sponsors that make uh, this possible. It's not just this video, but also the work that we do. Uh, much of the work that we do is uh, supported uh, by, by people like you in the audience. And thanks for all who joined um, the communication. 
Uh, and thank you, obviously, for all the people who work uh, uh, in, in the back scenes, uh, particularly Kristen and Claire, to really make this possible. So please continue to check out our website for more updates. And obviously, you can also find more information about our health center at, at our website, um, but also um, at um, for our 50th anniversary gala, which is coming up in April. So thank you all again once more, Leticia, Liz, Anna Lee, you guys were fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, and then many thanks to Jason as well. Thank you all again and good night. <laughs>